right, everyone, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Max Ringelheim. So welcome to the show, man. What's going on, everyone? Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Of course, man. Thank you for uh, coming on. And it's pretty cool. We're actually, for everybody listening or viewing, we're, we're not too far apart uh, physically, actually, <laughs> so, but we're doing this over Zoom. Um, so if you can, just uh, start us off, tell us a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Max Ringelheim, uh, originally from Long Island, New York, went to school at University at Buffalo, caught the entrepreneurial bug while in college. Um, and ever since, you know, basically over the last 10 years since graduating college, have been involved in a bunch of different really interesting tech startups. Um, one of which you guys are probably familiar with is, you know, remember those hoverboards? Yes, the devices that started blowing up, catching fire. Um, you know, that was part of my doing with a couple of co-founders of mine with a super popular uh, viral brand called Funky Duck. And, uh, you know, other than that, I uh, have been in some other really interesting uh, full-time roles at some really awesome companies like WeWork and Little Bits, and have just, you know, developed a present day, uh, a sales and marketing consulting business, uh, an emerging media entity called When Going Viral um, that I'm excited to tell you guys more about today and continue building out further and further um, uh, uh, as the future goes on. Awesome, yeah, I'm pumped to talk about this. Um, so uh, let me know if it is the same, but when you were in college and you said you caught the entrepreneurial bug, is that the hoverboard company or was that before the hoverboard? Yeah, great question. So no, the, the hoverboard was like, you know, a good five years after graduating college. So um, I first caught the entrepreneurial bug uh, as a sophomore uh, in college. Uh, where I attempted in 2008 to basically build like the Uber before Uber existed. Uh, it was a company called University Green Transportation. Uh, it was basically a hybrid taxi service for university populations to get around the local area uh, surrounding their said university campus using their university ID card to uh, pay for their trips. Uh, and so, yeah, that was like the first basic uh, uh, venture of mine that I tried really launching and entered a business plan competition uh, with that hybrid taxi service twice, uh, made it to the finals once, but never won. Um, it was in the you know third time being the charm entry into this competition. It was called the Panashi Business Plan Competition over at University at Buffalo. And uh, the third time was a charm. I won $10,000, but not to launch an eco-friendly taxi service, but rather to launch a video conferencing software company that I had started called Vonvo.com. Uh, and Vonvo was a, a video uh, chatting application where basically ordinary citizens like you and I, Tyler, could come and talk about all the subjects that matter, uh, crucial current events. Uh, so whether it was, you know, the war in Syria, Israel, Palestine, um, you know, gun control rights, you name it. Uh, we were having these awesome conversations related to crucial current events uh, and allowing ordinary citizens to kind of speak their mind about the topics that matter. Mm -hmm. And so the, did that, um, cause you've done a lot of companies. So I kind of want to walk through them because this is like, this is serial entrepreneur defined right here for everybody, in my opinion. Um, so that's wild though. So you literally had the like kind of Uber idea before Uber. That's pretty, yeah. Sick. Yeah. oh man. Um, but that's why it's about the journey and not necessarily the destination, right? Because that alone, I, I don't know for a true entrepreneur, it wouldn't, but for some people, it would maybe feel a little crippling, right? Because it's, it's like you were definitely onto something that yeah. could have been huge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, the joke that I, my friends, you know, make fun uh, in a playful way, you know, just about, you know, the whole Uber before Uber, right? Um, uh, it was just, it was really ironic timing because it was in 2008 when, you know, basically Uber put its first vehicle out, you know, in San Francisco. Um, but obviously it wasn't what anyone takes it to, you know, imagine Uber is today, right? This massive globally dominating transportation service, right? Um, but no doubt uh, it was painful when, you know, I lost in the finals and didn't win, you know, the $10,000 in that, you know, second entry uh, with that transportation idea. Um, it stunk. Like we, we're on the stage, had our uniforms on. We were like, just gave this badass presentation and people loved it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately we didn't win, but, you know, that's part of the journey. You enter a third time with a different venture two years later. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you place uh, in the competition, win 10 grand and 
can you know use those dollars to bootstrap your you know second venture, which was this video conferencing software company Vonvo. So um, yeah, and how did that end up? How, how did yeah. Vonvo end up? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I worked on Vonvo.com for three and a half years. Um, put my blood, sweat, and tears into it. Um, you know, a lot of long nights, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, just really grinding it out. Um, most, you know, knowingly, uh, or the biggest pain point I experienced during my Vonvo days was I was a non-technical co-founder, right? I didn't know how to code coming out of college. I was a business major in college. So trying to build a video conferencing software company no doubt about it, was really, really challenging. Uh, we didn't know how to write a single line of code. So I spent almost 18 months or so just looking for a chief technology officer, right, to help build this software. Um, and along that journey of 18 months, I got my source code stolen by, you know, one college uh, 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 <laughs> developer. I had, you know, an offshore uh, developer in Nepal, you know, take down my website the day after it was launched, you know, after paying a Canadian web development firm a bunch of money to get it built. So I definitely went through my own trials and tribulations trying to build a said video conferencing software company. But after 18 months, you know, we found uh, an onshore Brooklyn developer uh, who had a fascinating background and amazing experience to partner up with. And, um, you know, after three and a half years, unfortunately, uh, although we had acquired a couple of paying customers and, you know, had uh, uh, built three different iterations of the product, you know, and kind of bootstrap the company off about 150 grand, um, you know, which is not a lot of money <laughs> in the world of yeah, not startup, fund, startup financing. Um, after three and a half years, it just wasn't growing at the rate I was hoping it would. And so I kind of had to just like bury it in the graveyard, um, you know, and move on to the next venture, uh, which happened to be those, you know, uh, uh, notorious hoverboards, we'll call them. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, let's talk about the, the hoverboard. So, if you want, um, yeah, I kind of, I mean, I do have some specific questions then, but like, if you could just give the overarching yeah. story, because yeah, when I watched that two minute video clip of it, I, I didn't even realize it was that, like, I don't remember it like fully, right? Yeah. I, I remember like, it was definitely a thing. Yep. Um, but when I saw that video, I was like, oh my God, like, I think it said like Kim Kardashian or something like yeah. they were on it. And it just went huge within like weeks. So either way, I'll let you tell us. Totally. Yeah, no. So um, basically, you know, uh, the, the sort of long story short behind the hoverboard was, um, you know, late 2014, um, my two co-founders seem to be roommates um, in Queens, New York, uh, over in China. They discovered the hoverboard at a big trade show uh, conference over in China, kind of similar to that of like a CES in Las Vegas, but over in China. And um Discovered the hoverboard completely, you know, by chance and random, brought a few units over. I became fascinated with the device. You know, we basically uh, uh, moved our office from a basement of an apartment building to a, you know, actual real office uh, on Long Island, New York, um, bought a bunch of hoverboards. Um, and ultimately, you know, on a random trip to California, uh, they get in touch with uh, a really, really influential individual um, who just has interactions and is more or less best friends with all the different celebrities on the planet. And when I say best friends, like truly best friends with all those said celebrities. And uh, everyone who saw this device uh, just became fascinated with it. And so uh, when we're out in California, we learn a couple of days later, you know, that the uh, famous Kardashian, uh, Kendall Jenner, uh, was interested in one of our hoverboards. And, uh, you know, basically send a couple of those hoverboards over to her. A few days later, uh, she posts this phenomenal video on all of her social media accounts. And it's of her riding our hoverboard. And she makes like two or three turns. And on the last one, she basically like busts her ass. And so it's like this remarkable video, like as good as it gets um, of her riding around her kitchen and at the very end falling off. And I think I've seen that actually. Now that yeah. I have like an image in my, okay, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I yeah. yeah. And so- the, the caption of that <laughs> of that uh, post was got too cocky at Funky Duck, which was the name of our brand. And uh, within 24 hours, that said post um, had over a million likes, over 50,000 comments, and our own Funky Duck hoverboard following went from literally zero followers to basically you know 20,000 overnight. Um, and so that just was that lightning in a bottle sort of moment. 
that literally uh, tipped up our company, went viral overnight, um, and ultimately, uh, 14 months later, after you know, basically you know, doing well over a million dollars in less than eight, in eight weeks from the start of the company, um, all the way to you know, shipping out thousands of hoverboards. And fortunately, you might recall some of these devices started having battery malfunctions, and people started falling off and breaking their ankles, you know. And then homes started burning down after exploding hoverboards caught fire. Um, and although they weren't our hoverboards because we were buying a patented device from China with no battery malfunctions, um, all the crappy, dare I say, shitty ass knockoffs from China that were being <laughs> yeah. built in you know, washing machine factories and blue jeans factories, um, these devices started catching fire because their batteries were built with you know, very cheap, inexpensive, uh, uh, low quality components. And after about you know, two dozen homes burned down by Christmas 2015, uh, so literally not even a full year later, um, you know, the government stepped in and banned the device. Uh, FedEx stopped allowing you to ship the device, and lo and behold, you know you basically had a noose around your neck um, if you were in the hoverboard game uh, because you couldn't ship out your device to customers that were buying it, right? <laughs> and so, um, yeah. you know, basically, 16 months after starting uh, the company, I basically you know left um, because uh, it just had ultimately turned into the fad product of 2015, right? And so you really couldn't operate the business any longer, and I, I decided to move on. So two questions there. One is what was the, just like when you guys woke up to that post and then it going viral, like yeah. just what was it like? Like, I'm just curious if you could like kind of bring us there, like where were you and just like how crazy was it? Like what did your website go down? Like what, what happened? Yeah. Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, it was a surreal moment, right? Um, it was surreal even from, you know, the day that we heard that, Kendall Jenner was interested in promoting our company, right? Like we kind of, you know, if you th I, the analogy I give when I do a lot of my workshops um, when I'm teaching or, or, or speaking at different companies and schools to people who listen to these uh, workshops I do regarding the hoverboard story, I kind of compare the, the awe we were feeling was kind of like Will Farrell in Elf, right? Like we were that freaking, <laughs> okay? Like that's how it's excited for. <laughs> and, uh, after that post goes live, you know, we're sort of just in this sort of daze, like, holy shit, did this just really actually happen? And, uh, you know, you just basically start seeing your phone blow up, right? Like, literally, I got notifications on my phone uh, for three days straight of just people, you know, literally second after second of the day following our account, um, Funky Duck. That's how much, you know, viral traction we had gathered. And, you know, uh, it was also surreal because we were basically on back order from day one. <laughs> um, so, you know, basically we had about two dozen units in our office that we had moved into um, to sell at that point when that post went live, uh, yet we had a little bit of an issue. There was 150 orders that needed to be fulfilled <laughs> and yeah. you know, it's 150 people that had paid $1,500 for our hoverboard, right? They had just paid a pretty penny to get one of our hoverboards after seeing Kendall Jenner promoted online. So. It was a little bit of, you know, in awe that this had just really happened. Uh, but at the same time, holy shit, we got, you know, to get more units because we have a lot of customers that want this device. And those orders just kept flowing in. They didn't just stop after day one, as you can imagine. Yeah, it's a very word of mouth um, thing, uh, I guess you would say. Like, because once somebody does it and maybe they take it outside and then a bunch of people see it, like, I, yeah. I could see how, you know, Kendall Jenner uh, lit it, but essentially once it caught fire, besides the government shutting it down, it, yeah. literally there was no way to slow that down. <laughs> besides that, that was the yeah. only way. Um, yeah. So another question, I'm just curious, do you think they will ever like take it back? Meaning like, do you think there's a chance they could come back? Because obviously your product was fine. Yeah. Um, people can fall off, but people can fall off bikes too. I mean, that's with anything. Huh. So, um, yeah. Do you think they'll ever change their mind on that or? Yeah. So it's funny you say it. I mean, basically, uh, these days actually, so now we're in 2021 and, you know, uh, five years later, basically after those bans got implemented, um, you know, hoverboards are still around hoverboards are still purchased by, you know, kids and parents at Walmart. Um, I, I kid you not, um, on, Good Morning America the other day. Uh, they were talking about the top gifts this holiday season. And, you know, hoverboards were mentioned as one of the popular gifts that kids are still buying. So 
Um, although the product, you know, got tarnished very heavily in 2015 because of all the negative publicity that surrounded the device and certainly put a stain on the device to ever sort of hit the sort of popularity and mainstream popularity that uh, it had in 2015. Um, it is still a very fun device that people and children buy for birthday presents, holiday gifts and the like. And, uh, you know, it's pretty just wild to think about that, you know, in 2015, we were sort of the, the culprit behind starting the fad of the hoverboard, but that, you know, still actually holds relevancy today, uh, which is great to see, you know, um, from my side, I wasn't, you know, <laughs> you talk about the journey before you would ask, like, we took a lot of punches to the gut in 2015. Okay. Like well, really sure. freaking hard punches to the gut, you know, being the market leader and the brand leader behind this device. And so whether it was, you know, lacking the inventory because we were on back order from day one or, you know, flooding of inboxes, right? Like you imagine how many emails we were getting and how many phone calls we were getting literally after that post went live, you know, that oh, yeah. year was a wild year to be doing the hoverboard and to be not only just doing it, but actually being responsible for creating the tidal wave of traction that came about from it, right? So um, being at the top of the totem pole in that world in 2015 uh, definitely required taking a bunch of punches to the gut. And, you know, unfortunately I wasn't after 14, 15 months of working in that industry uh, willing to, I wasn't willing to stay patient, you know, through all of 2016 or 2017 to see if, you know, we would be able to kind of come back to life and continue selling it, right? Um, and so it just, it didn't work out on a, a multitude of reasons for me to wanna stay uh, involved in the business. You know, the two co-founders I had started with, they were the principal owners of the business. You know, unfortunately, you know, just some of the uh, uh, things like equity and whatnot that I would have hoped to have gained, you know, never came to fruition. And so I just decided to move on, right? And, you know, there was just a lot of problems hitting this company and this uh, industry all at once. And so it just kind of didn't make sense to continue on. And uh, as part of the journey, it's why I do a lot of what I do today, right? I tell the story behind this fascinating story because I can, you know, think very, uh, uh, I still think very highly of all the educational business lessons learned uh, that I gathered from the experience. And uh, I try to kind of put that knowledge forward to other aspiring entrepreneurs so they can not make the same mistakes that I, you know, unfortunately had to go through. For sure. That is wild, man. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, so let's, uh, I know, so tell us what, what do you do now, uh, actually? So you, you help, um, like you do consulting, uh, yep. from my understanding, you help people go viral and, but I'll, I'll let you speak it. And then I, I do want to ask you then my next question would be like, how do you go viral? Like in a planned fashion? Cause it seems yeah. like you learned that, but yeah. with the hoverboard, it was, maybe accidental at first, or maybe it was more planned than I uh, saw, so. Yeah, totally. Um, so in terms of what I do now, um, to answer your first part of your question, these days uh, I'm building an emerging media brand uh, called When Going Viral. Um, you can go check it out at whengoingviral.com. Um, and that's the handle for all my social media accounts at when going viral at Max Ringelheim. You can find the work that I do, but basically I'm a sales and marketing consultant presently. That's what pays the bills on a day to day. Um, and you know, this sales and marketing consulting work that I do for different companies all around the world, about a half a dozen right now, um, all layers up to this brand I'm building when going viral, which consists of, you know, the consulting work that I do. It also though consists of public speaking work that I do. So that's kind of like a second arm of it. Um, I do these fascinating, high energy, educational workshops uh, regarding my hoverboard story and other particular topics within the hoverboard story, you know, like e-commerce, building innovative products, how to go viral, a bunch of different subset of topics that I speak on um, and that I do, you know, paid public speaking, free public speaking related to. Um, and these workshops tend to just be bulletproof. People just absolutely freaking love them, right? Like I just put them on the journey typically of launching Funky Dot and I put them in the driver's seat and sort of have them go through what I went through, through this interactive high energy workshop. And so that's another element of the When Going Viral business is the public speaking work I do. Uh, I also have my own podcast called When Going Viral, which we'll make sure to feature this episode on, of course. Um, and on top of that, 
um, you know, I'm working on things like a book outline that I started, you know, writing years ago and uh, uh, things like um, uh, some other different, you know, media oriented projects uh, that I believe have uh, some potential to do a lot of good in this world and help educate the broader business community um, on the subject of virality and the subject of viral marketing and uh, everything that's baked into that very deep subject. Got it. Okay. And then, so with, uh, cause it kind of goes together, I would imagine like if somebody wanted to be like successful in, in running an e-commerce business and, you know, going viral would be a part of that success. Yeah. What advice would you give? And I just want to give a little side note. Um, it, it might not be uh, related, but there's a lot of people I see now, uh, like they say they'll create like an Amazon store or something okay. for you or like a Walmart store, yep. um, drop shipping or whatever. I'm not in that world. So I, I'm not, <laughs> I could be saying some of these things wrong, no, you're fine. but, but um, like, what are your, is that connected? And if so, like, what are your thoughts on that? And is it too good to be true? Cause sometimes it seems like it is that like, sometimes yeah. people are like, yo, I like this store works. These products sell. We're just going to, you know, pay us like 20 K we'll set you yeah. up with a store and then you get passive income for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah. I don't know, man, that seems a little fishy, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's a great question. So, I mean, you know, in the world of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who may be attempting to start e-commerce brands, right. Or create an e-commerce website, uh, sell a particular product online. If you are interested in gaining viral traction around this said e-com shop, uh, one of the first pieces of advice that I would give said company or said entrepreneur is make sure you are paying attention and have a dedicated fraud detection solution in place on your website. Now, your probably next question is like, well, why is that one of the main pieces of advice? Mm -hmm. uh, you only learn it from getting punches to the gut, like I got in 2015. And that is that online fraudsters, and there's plenty of them out there, they love going after new viral products, new companies that are experiencing viral traction. Why so? Because typically there's so much flooded traffic going towards that said product or company that they can kind of hide away in their little sliver of online fraud and do their thing, stealing honest people's credit cards like you and I. And typically be able to infiltrate a website because they're dealing with these thousands of orders or thousands of customers. And for the one or two or 10 online fraudsters that are doing, you know, the bad stuff on that said website, uh, you know, ultimately can just go and end up ruining your business if you're not paying attention to that online fraud. And, you know, when it comes to uh, developing a, a viral business or a viral e-com shop, you automatically end up having a target on your back because these you know, online fraudsters want to go and get your product because typically like your product, it's going viral because it's like the best out there, right? That's why people are going after it. And so when these online fraudsters get a hold of your said product, they can go and then resell that product on whatever said black, you know, market or, or, or dark market exchange, um, you know, at a premium, right? Because they probably just got your said product for zero dollars because they saw they stole someone else's credit card, right? So um, that's one really, really important piece of advice to share with folks. Um, and, you know, as it relates to like people uh, having an affinity towards trying to, you know, develop uh, viral businesses, like I totally tell them to go and get after it and to absolutely try and bake that into their said marketing plans. It's, you know, believe it or not, you know, extremely difficult, but at the same time, when you gain viral traction, so much of it just happens on its own, right? Like, once you create that viral spark, a lot of the added viral traction happens organically, right? Because you've created something that has these multi-purpose audiences that are sharing, commenting, resharing with their set audiences, whatever it is that you might be selling. And so, um, you know, typically it, it, it tends to have a little bit of that lightning in a bottle moment, kind of like what you were describing, like does it just happen accidentally? Um, oftentimes it can. It's sometimes very hard to plan it out, but there are definitely tried and true strategies out there, you know, for viral marketers out there. Um, and some of the things that I like to share that can give you a better chance of experiencing viral traction. But, you know, there's typically never any guarantees in life. So the last thing you want to think is that there's guarantees in the viral marketing world. Like, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems like, uh, you know, just based on how it worked out with Kendall Jenner, and obviously that's like, 
you know, she's one of the biggest celebrities in the world. So that I, that's a little different, but ultimately influencer marketing, you know, it's kind of like I tell people with books, right? Um, and I think me and you, maybe on one of our calls, we're kind of talking about this. The books that I've seen take off, like after we work with a client, um, that really take off, I mean, for the long term, it's because the stories in the book or story were remarkable enough that people were telling their friends. So it's like, we can get it in thousands, tens of thousands of people's hands, but if the story um, isn't remarkable enough, I'll just say, then, then it doesn't spread from there. So, right. you know, you want to make sure that your product, your book or whatever it is, is something that can spread like that. And then if that is proven to be a yes, that it is, then I feel like influencer marketing would be a huge way to go viral, right? Like, and that would be, let's just say people that have a million plus followers or something on oh. Instagram. And, you know, obviously you would want to check, make sure they're engaged followers and it's like all legit and stuff. But if so, you know, you, I don't know what the fee for that would be, but you'd pay those people to promote the product. And, you know, maybe you wake up a week or two later yep. and, you know, it's gone, right. Um, <laughs> or gone in a good way, meaning like to the moon. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so is that one of the strategies essentially like influencer marketing, would you say? Without a doubt. I mean, like, look, the influencer marketing has been around for decades, just more recently kind of got, you know, termed or coined influencer marketing. I would say over the, the last seven, eight years is like kind of where that term has really uh, uh, taken off. Uh, but it's been around for, you know, decades before that, when you think about, you know, TV commercials and the types of celebrities that they might feature in those said TV commercials, et cetera. Um, there's no doubt that, Influencer marketing is a tried and true uh, capability and uh, tool in the toolbox to experience uh, viral traction. Um, I think from your side, you mentioned, you know, it's got to be a good story, right? And then, you know, that, that person tells their other friends, you know, about that story. I think that's very important as well. And I think what you're partially getting at is also like, it's got to be a really damn good product, right? It's got to be a really damn good uh, service that you might be offering that, you know, there's some sort of magic baked into it or some sort of jaw dropper effect or emotion that gets triggered, right? Uh, yeah. That really just stimulates that person who's experienced it there, but then wants to tell other said friends, colleagues, family members, et cetera, about that emotion that they got triggered, right? And so like the perfect analogy is like during the early portions of the hoverboard days, late 2014, early 2015, before anyone knew what the hell a hoverboard was, when me and my two roommates and co-founders were riding on our hoverboards around Queens, New York, I mean, we would have freaking people in their cars with their kids driving in their car, and they would just stop in the middle of the road, looking at what the hell we were doing and how we were just like gliding so seamlessly, <laughs> uh, like a duck, right, on a pond uh, along the sidewalk or the streets. And like, that triggered that like jaw dropper moment for the parent or child in the car, like, what the hell are they doing? How are they doing that? I need to ask them more about it, right? And that's what the hoverboard offered was this extremely unique sort of magical device, right? That people just were saying, what the hell is that? And that, that concept just fueled the influencer marketing that we were doing, right? Because we were working with hundreds of influencers and everyone from Jamie Foxx, Justin Bieber to you name it, anyone who's anybody, right? Was promoting Funky Duck on social media. And so that plus some of this uh, emotional triggers that our damn good product, right, was sparking in people, um, just only fueled that viral coefficient call. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm curious what you think about this. Like, I, um, I always try to look at things and like, I'm very much like a minimal list, I guess you'd say. So, yes. and I try to simplify things. So I think that it's definitely not easy. Like, obviously, this is not easy to do. Yeah, But if you look at what it is and like why it works to me, based on just the conversation we've had so far, it is easy in a sense of like, you know, the hoverboard is the best example, right? Like you created something that was really cool and yeah. whether or not the um, Kendall Jenner thing happened, like obviously that sped things up dramatically. But if you just went out in New York, like every day with that hoverboard and, you know, you could have got video content, put it on YouTube and th that would have sped it up. But say the internet didn't even exist. Let's just say it didn't like you could give it and it would cost you some money. So you need some money, but you could give it uh, for free to somebody in like every major city or something, or like some of the biggest cities. 
and just be like, look, this is 1500 bucks. I'm going to give it to you for free for the yeah. next month. I want you to go out in the city for like two, three hours a day in front of the major areas. And just, and I think that yeah. alone, you, you would have eventually built multi-million yeah. dollar company, right? Yeah. Like, no doubt. I mean, like they're, you know, our thinking when we were getting ready to launch uh, Funky Duck and when we got our website built and while we were kind of moving from, you know, that basement of an apartment to a real office, you know, to store our hoverboards and everything, um, you know, we were thinking that an influencer marketing approach made a crap load of sense, you know, like it just, it made sense, you know, if we could just have these big time celebrities be promoting our business and promoting this product, it's going to speak for itself. But um, no doubt we were experiencing what you just described more or less like, you know, people just inherently being very just starstruck in awe by what we were riding on that could have absolutely developed uh, interesting paths towards, you know, uh, serious, you know, whether we're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in sales, like no doubt about it, that that product at that time, given how new it was, could have easily created some other pathways and, you know, uh, one way or another, you know, the story is what it is, but it would have been super interesting to see what, you know, handing out a dozen hoverboards for, to people for free in yeah. the biggest cities and, you know, near, uh, subways or whatever it might be you know, populous areas could have done for us. Um, but we just applied that gifting of a free hoverboard to our influencer marketing plan. That's literally what we did. We just gave these celebrities sure. their own hoverboard for no cost. And they're just like, this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. So we're going to promote it so that our fans can see how awesome this thing is basically. Yeah. That's all. So I wonder, I, I'm just thinking for like any product now, like if you can create something, say it's a toothbrush, right. But you create like an angle with it like a uniqueness about it there's something it's not your average toothbrush or something better or it doesn't even have to be better it could just be yeah. different yeah. um and then you gift it to some influencers um yeah. obviously not all of them are going to you know promote you or something but yeah. and then it could work right like this could be for any product it, it really just takes in the beginning some creativity because i don't i don't know how you guys necessarily came up with the hoverboard but like in my mind i'm thinking of like okay, there's a skateboard. People like to yeah. skateboard. So that's cool. Um, what if there was something that was different and maybe just different? Cause I wouldn't even say yeah. hoverboards better. It yeah. just depends what you like, but it's different enough that people will talk about it. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, look like from our side, what's really interesting is like, and I, we didn't cover this yet, but I'll just share it with you now. Like the hoverboard was invented three years earlier by an American inventor who got an American patent to a device that looked very similar to the device that we were selling, right? It was his US patent to this, you know, handlebar less sort of two wheel device, but no one knew what the hell it was. And he never marketed it. And he never actually like put it out there because, you know, he was an inventor that just, you know, had the mechanical engineering, electrical engineering capacity to invent and build and create and bring to market a hoverboard and get it patented. But that product literally just, stayed in stealth mode. It never literally turned into anything. And then it wasn't until us discovering it, you know, over in China in late 2014 from a Chinese patent owner, right? At a Chinese factory who had developed a similar looking device for himself that, you know, we got very inspired by it. And we felt like we could build a legitimate business around this said product. And um, that's, you know, how we were responsible for building the number one hoverboard brand in 2015, right? We weren't the inventors of the device. We were just, you know, the go-getter entrepreneurs that figured out a way to populate and popularize this device. And to the point of, you know, you know what's a, what was a global phenomenon in 2015. Like, I mean, this thing was literally everywhere from India to Europe to the US. Like it was literally everywhere. And, you know, there are reports out there and it was wild to read in 2016. And it's still wild to say today but like what was like one or two factories in China, what was one or two factories in China back in 2014, 2015, early 2015 that were producing this hoverboard device that was the factory we were working with turned into by Christmas, 2015, there were reports that there were over 10,000 factories in China that were producing a hoverboard device. That's how viral the device went, but from a, production capacity standpoint. And these were washing machine factories and blue jeans factories that were just literally assigning, you know, a couple of workers to reverse engineer the device that, you know, we were buying, right? The patented version of this hoverboard. And, 
these, these devices started flooding the US market and the European market by the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, right? Like it, it was crazy. Yeah, and this is why you, you need like different minds for, for teams like this, because like you were saying, like, you know, you could be the engineer or whatever that creates the hoverboard, but if you don't know marketing and like what to do with it, then it doesn't go anywhere. Like it's still cool, but right. like, and this is what Seth Godin t- talks about uh, in a sense is like packaging, like yeah. packaging of a product is, uh, I think, uh, so for people listening, don't quote me, but I think he might say that it's even more important than the product itself, like how it is actually just packaged. Yeah. Um, so I find that interesting. So yeah, you guys kind of saw the idea and then you blew it up because you knew how yeah. to do the marketing and saw the opportunity. Um, just a side note, because I have to get this out. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But I have to say this <laughs> because uh, with the toothbrush idea, I think I have an idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> what if there was a, a two head, a double headed toothbrush and it would save you time because it would, you could brush the top and the bottom at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Dude, right. guys, <laughs> somebody <laughs> <listen to me. laughs> <laughs> no, that's funny. but yo, it, you know, three minutes is the average brush. It's a minute and a half now. So, yeah. you know, you add that up over 10 years, you got a whole nother lifetime. Right? So, <laughs> so, wow. uh, I could just, I could just see the, the, the ads <laughs> on Facebook or something like want to, want to get, you know, 10 more days back in your life or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, dude. There's so many. I'm not even kidding. I might. I'm not gonna do it, but I might. Maybe I'll tell a couple of friends and see if they want to do it. <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, no. I just think what what I've gotten out of this. Um, I mean, the story is incredible, and your persistence in just continuing forward with everything is unbelievable. But I just think this was a reminder for me of just like if you have that entrepreneurial bug or spirit or whatever you want to call it, like you can create a business out of anything like you could go to amazon right now like this is what i'm thinking of like you know somebody could go to amazon and just look at all the products that are the top sellers and yep. toothbrush is just what came to my mind and just look and be like why is that doing so well how could i maybe tweak it or make it a little different unique and then you know sell that and like it's like the formula is already out there it's just putting yep. in the work yeah so, I, mean, I i i love working with the companies i work with now you know i, I kind of I'm pretty selective on the companies I consult with because I want to try and help their businesses, you know, be super successful. And it's not like I'm trying to turn every company I work with into a viral sensation. Like I just personally these days have gotten the opportunity to, you know, help build other companies' businesses. Some of my clients are international clients and I'm just helping them be basically their US GM, right? And I'm helping create their European business here in the States, right? And uh, there's just a natural... Uh, affinity slash love that I kind of gravitated towards at an early age, you know, sophomore year of college um, towards entrepreneurship. And for me personally, and I know this will resonate with you, um, Tyler, like I just sort of, after going through the hoverboard experience, felt like I had more or less a duty to share the lessons learned that had come from this fascinating roller coaster ride of a startup, you know, and of a not just a startup, like global phenomenon that I was a part- participant in, right? Um, and so for me, like after I left that space, you know, and it sucked, right? Like I felt like I was on top of the world for, you know, six months and then I felt like I was in the shitter <laughs> for another six months, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it just like very quickly sparked in my mind how I had to educate the broader business community on the cautions, concerns, and warnings associated with going viral. And that was sort of the inherent mission behind when going viral, my current business, that still resonates with me today. You know, like being able to educate the broader business community on, you know, the good and the bad that come with virality um, is going to help aspiring entrepreneurs or savvy businessmen that want to try and create a new business, avoid the, you know, mistakes that I made, as well as take advantage of the things that we did well. So it wasn't all bad. That's for sure. Right. Like, We had a lot of big time wins during that, you know, 14 month venture. So um, that was where this sort of inherent sort of educational mission of mine came to fruition. And that's why I do a lot of the blogging, podcasting, public speaking, talking on your podcast today to try and share and bring forward, uh, you know, to those listeners of yours, uh, you know, at least, you know, any one of the lessons that they hope they got from today's interview. I think that that hundred percent resonates. And I think that's like very common with entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, and I, that's probably why you said it would resonate with me is like, 
for me, the two things is, you know, when I wrote my first book, it was just, there's so many moving parts. It was just crazy. So once I went through it, I was like, oh, like, I don't want other people to go through this. Like, I'll help them with that. And then the other thing that we're building now called Find a Mentor, it's to like um, provide free mentorship for people because a mentor is what in the beginning changed my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I just think like, it's always like you solve your own issue. And once you solve it or problem issue, however you want to look at it, and then from there, you're like, oh, there's definitely others that have this problem and then you can help them with it. So, um, so yeah, what I want to do, just because we're wrapping up here, uh, leave the floor to you. If there's anything we didn't cover that you'd like to share, please do. And then um, let people know like social medias, website, how they can yeah. stay in contact with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, this was an awesome conversation. And- uh, really love doing this. So we'll have to now meet in person somewhere in Miami. I was going to say that we got to, man. That's the next time. <laughs> then we'll, then we'll, we'll do the next episode. So people know how, how lunch was, uh, no, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, ultimately, yeah, from my side, uh, if you could go ahead and follow me on, uh, social media, it'd be super appreciative. So it's just at Max Ringelheim, uh, and then it's at when going viral, just like how it sounds. Um, ultimately from my side, that'd be super appreciative. If you could follow my journey and the work that I'm doing on both of those fronts. Um, if you've got a business that you believe could use some help and a little bit of guidance, uh, I am always, always, always looking to try and, uh, advise, help support aspiring entrepreneurs. It's part of my kind of giving values that I, you know, think on every day. So, uh, if someone's looking for some help, um, you know, think of me as a potential resource, uh, for you. Um, I'm always open to having conversations with folks and, uh, if, you know, your business needed actual, you know, tangible help, um, perhaps there's a, a way to work together, you know, in a formal capacity, but I'm just genuinely very interested in always trying to be a, a supporting block, you know, to aspiring entrepreneurs and use my lessons learned and experiences to help uh, add value. So um, lastly, I would say if you work for any sort of organization uh, or entity or networking group, et cetera, and you are looking for a bulletproof story slash super interactive and fun uh, uh, experience for your said group entity, et cetera. Uh, I'd love the opportunity to do one of my workshops for you. Um, these when going viral workshops, I do the surveys all the time afterwards, and it is consistently, you know, rated a 10 out of 10 in terms of enjoyment. So people just absolutely love it and, um, would love the opportunity to speak at any one of your said, uh, events in the future. So thanks so much. Of course, man. I'm, I'm thankful to call you a neighbor. That's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate you coming on though, man. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Awesome. Great stuff. Thanks for having me.